Last month, we got into the start of what is considered to be the main part of the Star Wars Expanded Universe with the Thrawn Trilogy. This time, we're getting into the comic side of that with Dark Horse's first outing, Dark Empire 1. As we talked about in the Dark Times episode, after the end of Return of the Jedi, Marvel chose to let their license last. Lapse. By the time Lucasfilm started doing a serious push to revive the line through the expanded universe in the 90s, Marvel had scaled back the number of licensed properties they were covering in favor of more original properties, and by the time the bubble burst, they were no longer in any condition to pick up the license anyway. Writer Tom Veitch, and I apologize for mispronouncing his name, and artist Cam Kennedy had actually pitched the Dark Empire comic to Marvel originally, at the tail end of Marvel's time on the license, sort of, at the late 80s. The book was pitched for the Epic Illustrated line, which at that time was edited by Archie Goodwin, who had also been one of the champions of Marvel Star Wars during the early days. Unfortunately, partway through the writing process, political shakeups at Marvel led to Archie Goodwin leaving for DC and the Marvel higher-ups abandoning the project. By comparison, Dark Horse Comics, based out of Milwaukee, Oregon, had built up a strong working relationship with 20th Century Fox over their publication of the Aliens, Predator, and Alien vs. Predator comics, along with non-Fox licensed properties like Robocop and Terminator. That put them in an optimal position to get the license. Veitch, at the suggestion of Lucy Wilson at Lucasfilm, pitched the comic to Mike Richardson of Dark Horse, and... Richardson said that if Dark Horse could get the license, they would pick it up. Dark Horse got the license, and, well, the rest is history. Following the fall of Grand Admiral Thrawn, the Imperial Remnant has fallen into civil war. For a time, the New Republic has lost control of Coruscant, but they're now working to retake the planet. A attempt to push the Empire off of the planet, led by Lando and Luke Skywalker, has led to the destruction of their fleet, while Luke, Lando, and their Star Destroyer ended up being downed on the planet's surface. Leia and Han lead a rescue mission, which picks up the survivors from the war zone that is the streets of the former Imperial capital, but suddenly a force storm emerges, seemingly out of nowhere, and picks up Luke Skywalker and R2-D2, taking them to parts unknown. Meanwhile, new Imperial war machines known as World Devastators have emerged. These superweapons chew up large chunks of planets and use the raw materials to create new fighter craft and other weapons, which are then unleashed on the Republic. These vessels, while crude, are coordinated from a command signal deep within the galactic core. The Republic stages a defense on the world of Mon Calamari, while Han and Leia hunt down the source of this signal. Meanwhile, on the Imperial Throne World of Biss, Luke is brought before a reborn Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine has gained a new life by transferring his life force into a clone body, one of many, as they cannot contain the power of the dark side, and each clone, consequently, has a considerably lessened lifespan. Palpatine offers to make Luke his new apprentice. Luke accepts, hoping to overcome the dark side and the Empire from within. Meanwhile, 
The Trail of the World Devastators leads Han and Leia to Han's old haunt of Nar Shadda, a moon of Nal Hunta that is frequented by smugglers, and a world that is also fairly dangerous for Han and Leia as they both have bounties on their heads placed by the huts for their role in Jabba's death. Han and Leia team up with an old flame of Han's, Sala Zend. Zend has access codes to get the Deep Core, and in particular, the Imperial New Capital of Bis. Before they leave, Han and Leia have two big run-ins. First, they encounter a fallen Jedi named Vima Da Boda, who gives Leia her lightsaber. Second, they encounter a still-alive Boba Fett, currently teamed up with Dengar. Han, Leia, and Sala flee Narshada on Sala's ship, the Starlight Intruder, with the Falcon attached to the outside. Fett attempts to pursue in his new ship, Slave 2. However, he doesn't have the appropriate codes and ends up trapped outside Biss's planetary shield. On Biss, Leia and Han are captured. Leia is taken before Palpatine, who senses that Leia is pregnant with her third child, and that he wishes to take control of the baby as his next host body. That the child's power in the Force will make him far more compatible than Palpatine's clones. He also shows Leia a Jedi holocron that is in his possession, a holographic repository of knowledge operated by an AI guardian possessing the knowledge and personality of a previous Jedi Master, which can only be operated by someone who is Force-sensitive. The holocron's keeper is Bodo Bas, a non-human Jedi from the Ancient Republic. Luke helps Leia and Han escape with the holocron and R2-D2, who possesses shutdown codes for the world devastators. Luke also reveals that he was using his position within the Empire to reduce the effectiveness of the Imperial fleet, and that he was not actually accompanying them to their ship, instead projecting a Force illusion. As Palpatine rages and his existing clone nears the end of its life, Luke proceeds to the cloning tanks and starts destroying Palpatine's clones. However, Luke is not fast enough, and his one clone survives and is possessed by Palpatine. Palpatine overpowers Luke, and then with Luke as his prisoner, gives chase on his Eclipse-class Super Star Destroyer. On board the Falcon, Leia sees an ancient Force prophecy, saying, effectively, that Luke will need her help to defeat Palpatine. The Falcon and the Intruder emerge from hyperspace over Mon Calamari shortly before the Eclipse does. Leia turns herself over to the Emperor in hopes of saving Luke, and she is once again taken before the Emperor and Luke. Leia helps Luke return to the light side, and the two combine their Force abilities to overpower the Emperor. Palpatine summons another Force Storm in a last-ditch effort to destroy the Rebel fleet, but due to Leia and Luke's efforts, he loses control of it and it destroys the Eclipse instead. Luke and Leia escape in a shuttle, and Luke vows the Jedi will rise again. To the surprise of almost no one, the Empire fell into disarray following the defeat of Thrawn. You can reasonably assume that this is less of a case of a lack of competence on Pelion's part, and more related to Thrawn's strength of personality. The cloning technology at Wayland, and presumably other Imperial storehouses, was so the Emperor could clone himself. It could be theorized that the cloning of Jeruah Sabaoth was a test run for Palpatine's own cloning attempt. While the new rep had taken Coruscant, the seat of the Empire and the Old Republic, the Empire still holds much of the Deep Galactic Core. This makes sense, as the Core was likely easier for the Empire to hold, as the worlds are closer together and the supply chains are shorter. We have the introduction of the E-Wing Starfighter. This would end up becoming, in later works, the de facto successor to the X-Wing Starfighter. In the new Expanded Universe... Instead, we get further iterations on the X-Wing. We also have the introduction of Jedi Holocrons, which in turn provides a way for Luke and other Jedi to have ways to access information from earlier generations of Jedi in a manner that works well with the visual presentation. Much as with DC Comics' Watchmen, Dark Empire included text expanding on the world as something of a backup story. These include some stories that we'll see expanded versions of in the Tales of the Jedi comics, among other sources. A particular note here is the story of Ulic Keldroma and the introduction, in brief, of Nomi Sunrider, who we will see in the much more recent future in the Tales of the Jedi series. Luke Skywalker is willing to walk the path of the dark side in order to defeat it from within, 
which I'm pretty sure doesn't mean anything, but which does show how loose ideas of how the Force works were at this time. Leia Organa is carrying her third child, a boy. She is continuing her training in the Force, and is about as far along now as Luke was at the start of Empire Strikes Back. She has a bounty on her head from the Huts, and while Luke is more in turn with the, with the physical aspects of the Force, Leia is somewhat more spiritually in tune with the Force. To put this in perspective of the three West End Games Star Wars Force skills, Control, Sense, Alter, Luke is focused on Control, Leia is on Sense. You learn that Han Solo was formerly the partner of Sala Zend, and skipped out after she proposed to him due to a fear of commitment. She has since moved on, and he is quite happy where, she, where he is. The two are now on fairly friendly terms. Following the destruction of the Niklon mining operation and the losses in the Imperial Civil War, Lando Calrissian has rejoined the New Republic military. Emperor Palpatine has the Force ability to move his spirit to a new host body, and has an array of clones for this purpose in his own pursuit of eternal life. It is unclear if Vader or Thrawn knew about this. However, in the wake of the dialogue scene between Anakin and Palpatine in Revenge of the Sith, and considering how the Rule of Two works, keeping in mind that neither of those have been established yet, this makes for something of a good insurance policy. Boba Fett is still alive and kicking, although it's not clear exactly how. Currently, he's teamed up with another bounty hunter, Dengar, who we also saw on the scene from, from Empire Strikes Back. And Dengar also has a grudge against Han, though we don't, aren't clear why he has that grudge. It has frequently been remarked on that the coloring of the story is weird. Cam Kennedy has later admitted that he started losing his color perception around this time, which might relate to that. Also, this book was published somewhat contemporaneously with the Thrawn trilogy, which leads to some weird incongruities with those books. Later writers in the EU would latch on to Zahn more than to Veitch. However, several events in the story will still end up being brought up by later writers. In particular, the first book in the Jedi Academy trilogy begins a few months after this comic wraps up. On the one hand, this story has been heavily retconned from the EU, though bits and pieces would be picked up later. This is, in part, because the timing between this book and Zahn's book and how they all mesh, mesh together. However, of the bits from this, Holocrons became so instrumental to the EU as a way that Jedi knowledge could be preserved and passed on to future generations, and stories could be carried over from the distant past of the Star Wars universe, that that part on its own, with the introduction of the Holocron, makes this kind of worth reading. Cam Kennedy's coloring in this book is weird. For any other science fiction comic, I'd be fine with it. But for Star Wars, it doesn't feel quite right. But considering that, at the time, he was undergoing a loss of color perception, I can cut him some slack. The dialogue also, on the other hand, also doesn't feel right. There is a sense of humor present in Star Wars, even in its darkest moments. I'm like, check that. Especially in its darkest moments, as we saw in Empire Strikes Back and Rogue One, that is lacking in this story. Now, there's some humor in this book, like Lando bemoaning he's the only person in the New Republic to lose two straight Star Destroyers, and there are some additional bits with Sala that are in the radio play that aren't present here. But otherwise, this is a fairly serious, fairly weighty story. That said, I enjoyed it. This era of Star Wars comics reminds me of some of the 90s anime OVAs that came out, and I don't mean the ultra-violent, hyper-sexualized ones like Wicked City or Ninja Scroll. After been lying more or less alone for almost a decade, Star Wars was being actively cultivated again. And by this point, I had to, con to continue the metaphor, and it cross-pollinated with a variety of different sources, and everyone from the people at the top at Lucasfilm, Dark Horse, Bantam, to other writers working in the universe, to the fans and readers at the bottom, were seeing for the first time what fruit it would bear. 
So, reading something that is just so different from what we've had before is very exciting, especially in the light of knowing where we're going as well will be just as different. That said, seeing what will be pruned away does also make clear how important the concept of the Keeper of the Holocron, as an official position at Lucasfilm and now Disney, will become to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Without real coordination, things can end up going in wildly different directions. Now, before we go return to the novels, we have one more comic to take a look at as we look at the first Tales of the Jedi miniseries with Knights of the Old Republic. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.